Thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight. Thank you for postponing your vacation, your holiday. It's incredibly kind of you. And uh, what an honor and pleasure it is to be in this astonishing room and to be in Edinburgh. Um, so thank you. Um, I'd like to talk tonight just briefly before we get to my favorite part, which is just a conversation, um, about a longstanding mystery in the field of creativity research and, and the possibility that maybe it's been solved. And this is the mystery of how we look at those extremely successful creative people, those creators on the far right side of the bell curve, you know, Pablo Picasso, Bob Dylan, Steve Jobs, and, and we try to figure out what makes them different from the rest of us, from you and me. Because for a long, long time, for decades in fact, the answer hasn't been clear. You can give these highly successful creative people IQ tests, and it turns out they're not smarter than the rest of us. Their intelligence looks perfectly normal. And you can give them a battery of old-fashioned personality tests, Myers-Briggs and stuff like that. And once again, they'll look pretty normal. They'll look pretty ordinary. They may be a little bit more extroverted, a little bit more open to experience, but nothing too extreme. So, so what makes them so special? What, what defines this kind of highly successful creative achievement? Well, in recent years, I think psychologists have come up with an interesting answer. And it turns out to be largely defined by a relatively new character trait called grit. G-R-I-T has to do with persistence and stubbornness, single-mindedness, a sheer refusal to quit. I'm, I'm thinking here, for instance, of a local author you may have heard of named J.K. Rowling, who suffered through 12 rejections from publishers, but kept on writing about that boy wizard in coffee shops while her baby daughter napped. That right there is grit. Now, the best way to tell you about why grit is so important is to begin with the story about how it was first discovered. It's a story that takes place in 2004 and 2005 at West Point, the elite U.S. military academy. See, for decades, West Point had this problem that between 5 and 10 percent of cadets dropped out of West Point in the very first six weeks. It's a rough time. It's known as beast barracks. You get your head shaved. You go on long marches. You get yelled at. It woken up at 5.30 in the morning, and, and these cadets were just dropping like flies. This was a big problem for West Point because there are no transfer students. So these are future leaders of the Army you want to groom who are disappearing. West Point had tried in vain to predict retention, to find some variable, some measure that would allow them to figure out which cadets were most likely to make it through Beast Barracks. They looked at physical fitness, GPA, SAT scores, nothing worked. So in desperation, they turned to the psychologist named Angela Duckworth, now with Penn. They asked her, can you help us? Can you find some metric that will allow us to predict retention? She comes up with a short survey called the GRIT O survey. It asks questions in two different domains. The first domain is single-mindedness. Have you always wanted to go to West Point? Have you always wanted to be a painter, a poet, a computer scientist, an entrepreneur, a surgeon, whatever it is? Is this a goal, is this a passion you've carried around for a long time? And number two, how do you react to the inevitable frustrations and failures along the way? Are they a sign that you should double down and try even harder? Or are they a sign that this is the world telling you you're just not cut out for this? Maybe you should find a new goal. Those are the kinds of questions Duckworth asked. And what she discovered is that her grit o survey, it takes about two minutes to complete. You can take it on her website, just Google Angela Duckworth grit o survey. Her short two-minute survey was the first measure that allowed West Point to successfully predict retention, to successfully identify those cadets who not only make it through the first six weeks, but make it through the first four years. It's been used every year, and it works every single year. Now, since 2005, Duckworth has gone on to show that in field after field, grit is the single best predictor of success. So if you're trying to figure out which 12-year-olds are most likely to win the National Spelling Bee, it turns out it's not the smartest 12-year-olds or the ones with the highest IQ scores or the best grades. It's the ones with the highest levels of grit. Why? Because grit mediates deliberate practice. Grit allows you to practice the right way, which is not the fun way. You're trying to figure out which real estate agents are going to make the most money. It's the ones with the highest levels of grit. Which 
which cadets can become U.S. Army Special Rangers. It's the ones with the highest levels of grade, which amateur golfers most likely make the PGA Tour five years down the road. Not the ones with the best putts or the longest drives. It's the ones with the highest levels of grade, which teachers are most likely to make it through the first two years, going to lead to the biggest boost in standardized test scores among your students. It's the ones with the highest levels of grade. That, you know, as Angela points out, we live in an age where we are so obsessed with measuring talent, right? If we're trying to figure out which students we should let into college or university or which em prospective employees we should hire, we do this by giving, by giving them tests that measure their innate talent, that allow us to see what they're capable of when they are really trying hard, right? Peak motivation. We assume they're going to be motivated. But in the real world, success isn't just about talent. Success, the equation of success, is talent plus effort and grit measures the effort side of the equation. Now, I'd argue, and Duckworth would agree, that grit is particularly important in creative fields, right? Because almost by definition, making something new in the 21st century is going to be really, really hard. If it were easy, it would already exist. That poem would have been written, that patent would have been filed, that gadget would have been invented. So making something new in this day and age, when we've already plucked so much low-hanging fruit is going to involve lots of failure and frustration. It's going to involve iteration. It's going to involve the red pen on the page and the failed first draft, the trash prototype, and those people telling you you're not good enough. You are not cut out for this. You should find something else. In order to make it through that, in order to persist and, and still find a way to put in your 10,000 hours plus or minus 5,000 hours, you're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to lean on your grid. You're gonna have to rely on those muscles that allow you to simply not quit. There's a wonderful quote from Woody Allen that 80% that of success is just showing up. Well, grit, grit is what allows you to show up again and again. Now, this raises the obvious question of, can we teach grit? Is, is grit something you simply inherit, you know? Or can we build it up? Can we make ourselves better? When we talk to people at the Army, they say, well, of course you can build grit up. Every Army is in the grit building business. That's what we do. We take these soft citizens, these 17-year-olds, these and we turn them into soldiers. We, we allow them to do things that they thought would simply be impossible. And so we built up grit, sometimes very, very quickly, sometimes during basic training. So, so they would argue that, of course, grit can be built up, and there's some you know, the preponderance of scientific evidence is that they're right, that the current estimates are that grit, like most interesting personality traits, is about 50% nature and 50% nurture, which is actually quite good news. It means we can shift the grit, shift the grit curve, that we can actually build up this trait in all of us. But then the question becomes, how? How can we make ourselves grittier? There's not a whole lot of good scientific evidence, yet Angela's just beginning a longitudinal study of high school seniors in Philadelphia trying to figure out why some kids in these struggling schools who are surrounded by failure come to these very poor communities, why some kids find a way to make themselves better, to improve their test scores year in and year out. Sure enough, they score off the charts in grit, but she wants to understand how that cashes out in the real world. What does it actually mean in terms of you know, your habits, your routines, how you think about failure? And she's found some interesting stuff so far, such as these kids tend to have exemplars in mind. They tend to think about maybe it's a favorite sports star or a favorite scientist or favorite politician who somehow was able to persist through failure. They think about these people when they're going through failures of their own. That's how they pick themselves up. Other stuff. I find kind of interesting, such as these kids are less likely to explore counterfactuals. So in a sense, they're a little bit more thoughtless. When they're doing their algebra homework, they're less likely to think about the ball game on television. They just, they're just they not taking the opportunity cost of their activity. They're just saying, I'm going to do this because this is what I got to do. And so they do it. They're also less focused on the distant goal, you know, the long-term goal. They're paying more attention to incremental progress, the steps along the way, how they're a little bit better today than they were yesterday, that they checked off a few of those 10,000 hours in the morning, stuff like that. So they're focused on tangible progress, which keeps them motivated. But, but in the meantime, until Angela finishes her longitudinal study, she's got this great maxim I think we can all learn from, which is choose easy, work hard. That, that when we want to build up grit in our kids, what we should encourage them to do 
is to find that thing that feels fun, to choose easy, to, to choose an activity that doesn't require all their effort or self-control. Maybe it's painting, maybe it's drawing, maybe it's writing, maybe it's computer programming, maybe it's playing football. Who knows what it is, but, but pursue that activity that, that just makes you want to do it, that, that doesn't require lots and lots of effort, that, that you're intrinsically motivated for. And then once you commit to that goal, once you, once you say, this is what I want to do, then we have to remind them every single day to work hard, that it's going to require 10,000 hours, that it's going to require all, all the motivation and all the grit they can muster. Now, the larger lesson of grit is that, you know, success in any domain, and I think especially in creativity, it's not easy. We may choose easy, but it's never going to be easy, you know? Anything worthwhile is going to require lots and lots of work, and that's why it takes grit. Thank you so much for listening. I very much look forward to our conversation. Thank you.